Let's turn to the fourth chapter, the first verse. As my seminary professor, Don Gallon, once said, the scribe was sleeping. Something must have happened there in the translation. Listen now to God's word. Jesus, full of the Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, turn this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up on a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. So if you worship me, it will be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, and is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I ask now that we would see you. You would take my words and by your Holy Spirit make them yours. And that those things that are seeds would plant in us and grow, and that you would feed them by your Holy Spirit, and that we would continue to be guided by them. And that the chaff would be blown away, forgotten, consumed in the fire. Amen. As Lent begins, we always encounter this text of Jesus in the wilderness. Confronted by the devil, and with good reason, this confrontation is our confrontation from the beginning, from the days of Genesis. In the Screwtape Letters, theologian C.S. Lewis notes that when it comes to the devil, we're either guilty of two things. One is the result of not giving him any thought at all, or the opposite, too much, and being fixated in an unhealthy Ironically, either way pleases the devil no end. A win is a win from the devil's standpoint, and welcome news. In preparing this message, I heard a story about a person who, when they first considered this idea of an enemy that we face, the nature of this cosmic battle in which we are either for or against the kingdom of God, for or against the kingdom of darkness or that of light, and to my surprise, once they heard about the spiritual warfare, they thought it was incredibly exciting. Not overwhelming, not discouraging, not daunting. Instead, this understanding changed the complete context of their lives. It elevated it. Even the mundane, the daily struggles. From then on, they faced any question in which their lives were concerned as part of this larger, bigger picture this greater conflict that they were participating in. Evil, the devil's sandbox, manifests itself in various ways that we can talk about. Sometimes it comes from us, individual human beings, drawn into destructive things that we do from our hearts, bitterness and malice, envy and hatred. We consider the social structures around us, that take advantage of those who are poor, those who are weak, the tyrants that do unspeakable things <coughs> to those who are under their feet. These are sins that are committed by human beings. And there's also the evil that's outside us, that's the embodied in a fallen angel, a power that is intentional, is in opposition to God's kingdom. Luke refers to that evil as the devil, or the slanderer, <coughs> but this evil persona has lots of names in scripture. And consider his tactics. Think back to Genesis, Adam and Eve, where the slander, the father of all lies, John calls him the prince of this world, insinuates 
that not being able to eat the fruit of that tree <coughs> is really motivated by God's concern that by doing so they're going to become like God. The devil plays on their pride, encourages their disobedience, <coughs> and impugns the character of God. Falsely spreading a rumor without a desire or an interest in the truth, but the intent to do the opposite. That's the slander. Unfortunately, we also all have experienced the actions of slander against us <coughs> or even the perpetrators. But the devil has a larger goal here. The slanderer's intent is to present us with a false picture of God. So that we find ourselves justified, ourselves in, in paying no heed, no honor, no holiness to God. Satan, the word that is used in the parallel passage in Mark, means the adversary, the one who stands in the way of God's kingdom. Now whatever your name or understanding, being in conflict with this enemy, it, it fits my experience, your experience in life. We're up against a power, an adversary that's against love, that's against truth, that's against goodness and justice. And we see this individually, but we see it on a global scale. We're real aware of it right now because of what's happening in Ukraine where people are so determined to impose their will and seize a sovereign nation and use their power that they'll allow a situation where thousands will die. Their homes will be destroyed and they'll be forced to become refugees. They didn't ask for that. People who become refugees don't see that. And this is happening in countless places not on the front pages around the world. We see and are battling this kind of evil all around us in the world, in our own nation. Hatred, slander, lies. This kind of evil sometimes takes hold of us and makes us do things or say things that we do that sometimes the thing we very much love deeply regret it. And afterwards we'll pause and we'll say, why did I say that? Where did that come from? At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he was willing to be baptized. Why? So that he could show God's solidarity with you, with me, in our human struggle against evil. Jesus came not only to take away the sins of the world, but to destroy the devil's work, the, the reign of death. He came to confront the slander, the adversary, to bind the strong man, this purported prince of this world. <coughs> the saving mission of Christ can only be understood if we look at our position against the devil. Our world is filled with grief, sorrow, but beyond the power of Satan is the power of God, a greater power. The New Testament is all about a new incarnation, a new age, a new covenant, made like the old one in blood. <coughs> the final victory of the, over the old age, over the devil's schemes and plans. So immediately after his baptism, the Holy Spirit drives Jesus into the wilderness where he meets the opponent. And just like the Israelites wandered in the desert for 40 years, Jesus wanders in the desert for 40 days. And scripture records those three temptations that come at the end of that time. He's vanished. He's vanished. So make the stones into bread. One about protection. One about power. But let's not be confused. In those 40 days that he was in the wilderness, he was tempted by the whole range of sins. Everything that you and I are tempted by. Not just the ones that Luke's gospel shares as the tailor-made temptations for Jesus. 
He's our Savior. He experienced them all. Because that's what God knew to do. While the passage ends with the, temp with the devil retiring to, I was told it's not, a more opportune time. Our passage was that first opportunity. <coughs> Why the wilderness? Because in the wilderness we experience our frailties, our disappointments, our fears. Because in the wilderness we find that we are totally dependent on various circumstances in which we have no control. The wilderness is the opportune time. And it's more than just geography. It comes in all sizes and shapes. You, if you've been to the southwest of the United States, you've seen a wilderness area, probably like the one that Jesus <laughs> had in. But your wilderness also could be a waiting room, or as you look for a new job, or if someone tells you that you didn't make the team. Or you didn't get that position you hoped for. You enter the wilderness and all of a sudden everything that seemed by appearances to be in place is taken away from you. A while ago I was cleaning out a desk in our house in the drawer and I found a, a biggie. It was Julia's favorite. I could tell it was a favorite because he had a nice piece of red ribbon tied on to it. I remember how she used to play with that with her fingers. We lost that darn thing, so they had lost it many times and made him die. So we kept one sentimentally. You know, most of us have something though, that quiets us down, right? That gives us a sense of security. And the wilderness is the place where that's taken away from us. Where the foundation that we feel like we're standing on is crumbling. Where all that stability and security is longer right there in your fingertips. In the wilderness, you are tempted to demand from God more bread, more power, more protection. Jesus is in the wilderness and he's having his identity challenged. If you're the son of God, turn these stones to bread. <laughs> so likewise, in temptation, our identities are challenged as children of God, as believers. What can happen when we don't get what we want our way is that we start to get weary of the faith. Last summer, Sharon and I went to a seminar on the deadly sins. We spent a bit of time, a good bit of time, talking about some people back in the third century who we call the desert fathers and mothers. They went into the desert not to escape the devil, but to fight the devil. And they found that in their battles, that one of the most difficult and strongest temptations was acedia. That's Greek, but that means the sin of slothfulness, laziness. They even referred to it as the devil of the noonday sun. You know, the sun is warm in the middle of the day, and you don't feel like doing anything. As disciples of followers of Christ, that slothfulness turns, turns out to be for us indifference, spiritual indifference, losing your passion for who Jesus calls you to be as a follower. So based on our experience, those who went into the desert full of enthusiasm and light warn you that the greatest temptation in your life as a disciple is acedia, is slothful. Because it eats away at your commitment to Christ, your commitment to the gospel. You become practiced in doing the right things, but not feeling or experiencing the calling that God has placed on you. The power that Christ has put in you to make a difference, not just in your life in terms of how he saved you, but how he actually intends for you to go out as a follower and help others to discover that same saving power too. When Christ is confronted in the wilderness with those three temptations, he responds with biblical texts. Now, I don't think this is a case where it's like one upsmanship, one scriptural text, and then Jesus somehow has a better one. 
The devil says to the Son of God, Surely you have the power to make these stones into bread. I mean, you're famished, right? But Jesus says, We don't live by bread alone. In every case, Jesus underscores his answers by quoting Deuteronomy. That our call is not for more bread, for more power, for more protection. That temptation is not just about food and being hungry. It's, it's about the hunger that you and I have. What are our appetites? Are they appetites for things that are of this world, or are they for faithfulness with God? And because every time I sit down and I have lunch, darn it, by dinner, I'm not hungry again. That temporary relief, if that's what we think Jesus is about, then he's no better than the magician. Than a magician, there we go, who changes the appearance of things for a while. The devil then offers to give him all of the kingdoms of this world. But the Son of God came precisely to return all of those kingdoms to God. And he's temp tempted to do that without the saving work of the cross. An unholy way to get to a holy go. Holy Lord, to avoid the path of redemption. And then they're up there on the top of the roof, looking down the Kidron Valley. He says, throw yourself down. Those angels will come and catch you. We can all then be certain. This temptation deceives us into thinking it is better to be certain about God's love. Few things are more dangerous to spirituality than certainty. Because spirituality thrives in the context of choice. When we're not certain. With love, there is no certainty. And with certainty, there's no love. It's only faith that brings those two things together. The significance lies at the heart of all these temptations. They assume that the devil owns this kingdom of the world and can give it splendor to us if we ask for his help. It's a reminder to me that any time I think that I'm trying to do something just on my own because I can do it by myself, that I better watch out because the devil might be behind that scheme. Because our dependency belongs to God. Because our world. Our call is to trust the Lord, to worship the Lord. Jesus says this later whenever he says that God knows that you need clothing and food, but you must first seek his kingdom. This season, Lent, which actually means spring, replicates those 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And we're already into that. Those 40 years when God trained up his people, equipped them to be ready to go into the promised land. Now we have 40 days to look with hope for spring. And at the, home, at the end, we hope we'll see flowers and greening. But I also hope that we'll see a renewal of our spirits, a greater understanding of the redemption of God. Barbara Brown Taylor suggests that you take the image of gardening, you prune for new and fresh growth. And maybe we need to think of pruning as repenting. There are things that we need to repent of. There are some things in everybody's life that we need to either subtract or we need to add. That doesn't mean that sometimes necessarily those things are always bad. But you know what they do do? They take up a lot of our time. Think about what you do with your time. How much time do you spend on your device? How much time do you spend trying to find another show on Netflix or something else to watch? And that time, it just flitters away. I'll sit there and I'll say, gee, I've been looking for a movie for 15 minutes. Maybe I'm not supposed to watch a movie. We need to sort out and take stock of what time we have, and what is sufficient in terms of the task that is opening for us, of opening our souls to God. 
so that we don't become victims of spiritual sloth. We need to fertilize our spiritual lives. We need to water them and be more capable of rejoicing in God. More than bread, power, and protection, we need God. Jesus in his temptations three times tells us that that's what matters. That God is the real thing. Not used. Not tested, but worshipped. So I'm going to make a suggestion for this Lent. I'm just, and it's not even a hard one. I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to completely direct you on how you do this. I'm suggesting that you just simply take a scripture passage. Maybe every day. I'm not even going to tell you how to do that either. And write it out. It doesn't have to be a long passage. Write it out and leave some space in your margins for wondering. Wondering how God is speaking to you through that. You know, we have Lenten devotionals back in the back table, out here in the, in the chapel. You've received an email, a link to the passages that the seminary is using this year. Reverend Sharon sent, oh, I sent you this morning in an email, a, a whole list of scriptures that she's using for study this week. What if you took some of those and you started taking just some of them and writing them down? And using that as a possible resource for you. You know what? I'll, I'll almost guarantee you, I will guarantee you, that if you invest your time in God's Word, that God will change you for the better, for the good, in the middle of it in ways that you will never be able to anticipate or see coming. What all of us daily need is to be near to God. The devil, the slander, the opposition likes nothing better than to keep us busy, rushing about, so there's no time for that. It's a spiritual battle. This Lent, you want to make a difference. And to God be the Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, give us your power against the atmosphere. Give us your power against the devil's schemes, all the devil's attempts to distract, to dissuade, try to steal away the time that we would have with you and keep us steadfast. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Would you join me as we affirm our faith using the words of the bulletin? Our hope is God, our holy parent, who makes all things and from all blessings flow. God's faithfulness is the anchor of our hope. Our trust is in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. More than a teacher,